Hello, welcome back to the Truro County Public Library's reading series. Now before we begin, I wanted to remind you real quick to do your 2020 census if you haven't done so already. All you have to do is go to census2020.gov and get your information to report there, either through online, by phone, or by mail. You do not need the card that comes into the mail. All you need is your home address in order to begin reporting right away. Now, thank you very much, and I will get back to the show. Today, we will be reading chapters 9 and 10 of Henry James's Turn of the Screw. Last time, when we read, we left the governess off confronting Mrs. Gross and learning more about the former valet, Peter Quint, and his relationship with her current pupils. We also learned the identity of the new specter, Miss Jessel the current governess's predecessor. This reveal also indicates the unhealthy control and relationships Peter Quint had over the people of Bly Manor. Today, we will follow the governess as she thinks over the new revelations and encounters strange sights in the middle of the night while walking through Bly Manor. Chapter 9 I waited and waited, and the days took as they elapsed something from my consternation. A very few of them, in fact, passing in constant sight of my pupils without a fresh incident, sufficed to give to grievous fancies and even to odious memories a kind of brush of the sponge. I have spoken of the surrender to their extraordinary childish grace as a thing I could actively promote in myself, and it may be imagined if I neglected now to apply the source of whatever balm it would yield. Stranger than I could express, certainly, was the effort to struggle against my new lights. It would doubtless have been a greater tension still, however, had it not been so frequently successful. I used to wonder how my little charges could help guessing that I thought strange things about them and the circumstances that these things only made them more interesting was not by itself a direct aid to keeping them in the dark. I trembled lest they should see that they were so immensely more interesting. Putting things at the worst, all, at all events, as in meditation I so often did, any clouding of their innocence w could only be blameless and foredoomed as they were a reason the more for taking risks. There were moments when I knew myself to catch them up by an irresistible impulse and press them to my heart. As soon as I had done so, I used to wonder, what will they think of that? Doesn't it betray too much? I would have been easy to get into a sad, wild tangle about how much I might betray. But the real account, I feel, of the hours of peace I could still enjoy was that the immediate charm of my companions was a beguilement still effective even under the shadow of the possibility that it was studied. For if it occurred to me that I might occasionally excite suspicion by the little outbreaks of my sharper passion for them, so too I remember asking if I mightn't see a queerness in the traceable increase of their own demonstrations. They were, at this period, extravagantly and preternaturally fond of me, which, after all, I could reflect, was no more than a graceful response in children perpetually bowed down over and hugged. The homage of which they were so lavish succeeded in truth for my nerves quite as well as if I never appeared to myself. As I may say, literally, to catch them at a purpose in it, they had never, I think, wanted to do so many things for the poor protectress. I mean, though they got their lessons better and better, which was naturally what would please her most, in the way of diverting, entertaining, surprising her, reading her passages, telling her stories, acting her charades, pouncing out at her in disguises as animals and historical characters, 
and above all astonishing her by the pieces they had secretly got by heart and could interminably recite. I should never get to the bottom. Were I to let myself go, even now, of the prodigious private commentary, all under still more private correction, with which I, in these days, overscored their full hours. They had shown me from the first a facility for everything, a general faculty which, taking a fresh start, achieved remarkable flights. They got their little tasks as if they loved them. They indulged, from the mere exuberance of the gift, in the most unimposed little miracles of memory, they not only popped out at me as tigers and as Romans, but as Shakespeareans, astronomers, and navigators. This was so singularly the case that it had presumably much to do with the fact as to which, at the present day, I am at a loss for a different explanation. I allude to my unnatural composure on the subject of another school for miles. What I remember is that I was content for the time not to open the question, and that contentment must have sprung from the sense of his perpetually striking show of cleverness. He was too clever for a bad governess, for a parson's daughter, to spoil, and the strangest, if not the brightest thread in the pensive embroidery I just spoke of, was the impression I might have got. I had dared to work it out, that he was under some influence operating in his small intellectual life as a tremendous incitement. If it was easy to reflect, however, that such a boy could postpone school, it was at least as marked that for such a boy to have been kicked out by a schoolmaster was a mystification without end. Let me add that in their company now, and I was careful almost never to be out of it, I could follow no scent very far. We lived in a cloud of music and affection and success and private theatricals. The musical sense in each of the children was of the quickest, but the elder in especial had a marvelous knack for catching and repeating. The schoolroom piano broke into all gruesome fancies, and when that failed, there were confabulations in corners, with a sequel of one of them going out in the highest spirits in order to come in as something new. I had had brothers myself, and it was no revelation to me that the little girls could be slavish idolaters of little boys. What surpassed everything was that there was a little boy in the world who could have, for the inferior age, sex and intelligence so fine a consideration. They were extraordinarily at one, and to say that they never either quarreled or complained is to make the note of praise coarse for their quality of sweetness. Sometimes, perhaps indeed, when I dropped into coarseness, I came across traces of little understandings between them, by which one of them should keep me occupied while the other slipped away. There is a naif side, I suppose, in all diplomacy. But if my pupils practiced upon me, it was surely with the minimum of grossness. It was all in the other quarter that, after a lull, the grossness broke out. I find that I really hang back but I must take my horrid plunge. In going on with the record of what was hideous at Bly, I not only challenged the most liberal faith for which I little care, but, and this is another matter, I renew what I myself suffered. I again push my dreadful way through it to the end. There came suddenly an hour after which, as I look back, the business seems to me to have been all pure suffering, but I have at least reached the heart of it, and the straightest road out is doubtless to advance. One evening, with nothing to lead up or prepare it, I felt the cold touch of the impression 
that had breathed on me the night of my arrival, and which much lighter than, as I have mentioned, I should probably have made little of in memory had my subsequent sojourn been less agitated. I had not gone to bed. I sat reading by a couple of candles. There was a room full of old books at the line, last century fiction, some of it, which, to the extent of a distinctly depreciated renown, but never to so much as that of a stray specimen, had reached the sequestered home and appealed to the unavowed curiosity of my youth. I remember that the book I had in my hand was Fielding's Amelia, also that I was wholly awake. I recall further both a general conviction that I was horribly late and a particular objection to looking at my watch. I figure finally that the white curtain draping, in the fashion of those days, the head of Flora's little bed, shrouded, as I had assured myself long before, the perfection of childish rest. I recollect, in short, that though I was deeply interested in my author, I found myself at the turn of a page, and with his spell all scattered, looking straight up from him and hard at the door of my room. There was a moment during which I listened, reminded of the faint sense I had had the first night, of there being something undefinably astir in the house, and noted the soft breath of the open casement just move the half-drawn blind. Then, with all the marks of a deliberation that must have seemed magnificent, had there been any one to admire it, I laid down my book, rose to my feet, and taking a candle, went straight out of the room, and from the passage, on which my light made little impression, noiselessly closed and locked the door. I can say now neither what determined nor what guided me, but I went straight along the lobby, holding my candle high, till I came within sight of the tall window that presided over the great turn of the staircase. At this point, I precipitously found myself aware of three things. They were practically simultaneous, yet they had flashes of succession. My candle, under a bold flourish, went out, and I perceived, by the uncovered window, that the yielding dusk of earliest morning rendered it unnecessary. Without it, the next instant I knew that there was a figure on the stair. I speak of sequences, but I required no lapse of seconds to stiffen myself for a third encounter with Quint. The apparition had reached the landing halfway up and was therefore on the spot nearest the window where, at sight of me, it stopped short and fixed me, exactly as it had fixed me from the tower and from the garden. He knew me as well as I knew him, and so, in the cold, faint twilight, with a glimmer in the high glass, and another on the polish of the oak stair below, we faced each other in our common intensity. He was absolutely, on this occasion, a living, detestable, dangerous presence. But that was not the wonder of wonders. I reserve this distinction for quite another circumstance. The circumstance that dread had unmistakably acquitted me, and that there was nothing in me unable to meet and measure him. I had plenty of anguish after the extraordinary moment, but I had, thank God, no terror, and he knew I hadn't. I felt myself at the end of an instant magnificently aware of this. I felt in a fierce rigor of confidence that if I stood my ground a minute, I should cease, for the time at least, to have him to reckon with, 
and during the minute accordingly, the thing was a human, and hideous as a real interview. Hideous, just because it was human. As human as to have met alone in the small hours, in a sleeping house, some enemy, some adventurer, some criminal. It was the dead silence of our long gaze at such close quarters that gave the whole horror, huge as it was, its only note of the unnatural. If I had met a murderer in such a place, and at such an hour, we still at least would have spoken. Something would have passed in life between us. If nothing had passed, one of us would have moved. The moment was so prolonged that it would have taken but little more to make me doubt if even I were in life. I can't express what followed, it save but saying that the silence itself, which was indeed in a manner an attestation of my strength, became the element into which I saw the figure disappear in which I definitely saw it turn, as I might have seen the low wretch to which it had once belonged turn on receipt of an order and pass, with my eyes on the villainous back that no hunch would have more disfigured, straight down the staircase and into the darkness in which the next bend was lost. Chapter 10 I remained a while at the top of the stair, but with the effect presently of understanding that when my visitor had gone, he had gone. Then I returned to my room. The foremost thing I saw there by the light of the candle I had left burning was that Flora's little bed was empty. And on this I caught my breath with all the terror that, five minutes before, I had been able to resist. I dashed at the place in which I had left her lying, and over which, for the small silk counterpane, and the sheets were disarranged. The white curtains had been deceivingly pulled forward. Then my step, to my unutterable relief, produced an answering sound. I noticed an agitation of the window blind, and the child, ducking down, emerged rosily from the other side of it. She stood there, in so much of her candor, and so little of her nightgown, with her pink bare feet and the golden glow of her curls. She looked intensely grave, and I had never had such a sense of losing an advantage acquired, the thrill of which had just been so prodigious, as on the consciousness that she addressed me with a reproach. You naughty, where have you been? Instead of challenging her own irregularity, I found myself arraigned and explaining. She herself explained, for that matter, with the loveliest, eagerest simplicity. She had known suddenly, as she lay there, that I was out of the room, and had jumped up to see what had become of me. I had dropped, with the joy of her reappearance, back into my chair, feeling then, and then only, a little faint, and she had pattered straight over to me, thrown herself upon my knee, given herself to be held with the flame of the candle full in the wonderful little face that was still flushed with sleep. I remember closing my eyes an instant, yielding consciously, as before the excess of something beautiful that shone out of the blue of her own. You were looking at me out of the window, I said. You thought I might be walking in the grounds? Well, you know, I thought someone was. She never blanched as she smiled out that at me. Oh, how I looked at her now. And did you see anyone? Ah, no, she returned almost with the full privilege of childish inconsequence, resentfully, though with a long sweetness in her little drawl 
of the negative. At that moment, in the state of my nerves, I absolutely believed she lied. And if I once more closed my eyes, it was before the dazzle of the three or four possible ways in which I might take this up. One of these, for a moment, tempted me with such singular force that to resist it I must have gripped my little girl with a spasm that wonderfully she submitted to without a cry or a sign of fright. Why not break out at her on the spot and have it all over? Give it to her straight in her lovely little lighted face. You see, you see, you know that you do and that you already quite suspect I believe it. Therefore, why not frankly confess it to me, so that we may at least live with it together, and learn, perhaps, in the strangeness of our fate, where we are and what it means. This solicitation dropped, alas, as it came. If I could immediately have succumbed to it, I might have spared myself. Well, you'll see what. Instead of succumbing, I sprang again to my feet, looked at her bed, and took a helpless middle way. Why did you pull the curtain over the place to make me think you were still there? Flora luminously considered, after which, with her little divine smile, because I don't like to frighten you. But if I had, by your idea, gone out, she absolutely declined to be puzzled. She turned her eyes to the flame of the candle, as if the question were as irrelevant, or at any rate, as impersonal, as Mrs. Marsett, or nine times nine. Oh, but you know, she quite adequately answered, that you might come back, you dear, and that you have. And after a little, when she had got into bed, I had, a long time, by almost sitting on her for the retention of her hand, to show how I recognized the patience of my return. You may imagine the general complexion. From that moment of my nights, I repeatedly sat up till I didn't know when. I selected moments when my roommate unmistakably slept and, stealing out, took noiseless turns in the passage. I even pushed as far as to where I had last met Quint but I never met him there again, and I may as well say at once that I on no other occasion saw him in the house. I just missed on the staircase, nevertheless, a different adventure. Looking down it from the top, I once recognized the presence of a woman seated on one of the lower steps with her back presented to me, her body half-bowed, and her head, in an attitude of woe, in her hands. I had been there but an instant, however, when she vanished without looking round at me. I knew for all that exactly what dreadful face she had to show, and I wondered whether, if instead of being above, I had been below. I should have had the same nerve for going up that I had lately shown Quint. Well, there continued to be plenty of call for nerve. On the eleventh night after my latest encounter with the gentlemen, they were all numbered now, I had an alarm that perilously skirted it, and that indeed, from the particular quality of its unexpectedness, proved quite my sharpest shock. It was precisely the first night during this series that, weary with vigils, I had conceived I might again, without laxity, lay myself down at my old hour. I slept immediately, and, as I afterwards knew, till about one o'clock. But when I woke, it was to sit straight up, as completely roused as if a hand had shaken me. I had left a light burning, but it was now out, and I felt an instant certainty that Flora had extinguished it. 
This brought me to my feet and straight in the darkness to her bed, which I found she had left. A glance at the window enlightened me further, and the striking of a match completed the picture. The child had again got up, this time blowing out the taper, and had again, for some purpose of observation or response, squeezed in behind the blind and was peering out into the night, that she now saw, as she had not, I had satisfied myself the previous time, was proved to me by the fact she was disturbed neither by my reillumination, nor by the haste I made to get into slippers and into a wrap. Hidden, protected, absorbed, she evidently rested on the sill. The casement opened forward and gave herself up. There was a great still moon to help her, and this fact had counted in my quick decision. She was face to face with the apparition we had met on the lake, and could now communicate with it as she had not then been able to. What I, on my side, had to care for was, without disturbing her, to reach from the corridor. Some other window turned to the same quarter. I got to the door without her hearing me. I got out of it, closed it, and listened. From the other side, for some sound from her. While I stood in the passage, I had my eyes on her brother's door, which was but ten steps off, and which, indescribably, produced in me a renewal of the strange impulse that I lately spoke of as my temptation. What if I should go straight in and march to his window? What if, by risking to his boyish bewilderment a revelation of my motive, I should throw across the rest of the mystery the long halter of my boldness. This thought held me sufficiently to make me cross to his threshold and pause again. I preternaturally listened. I figured to myself what might portentously be. I wondered if his bed were also empty and he also secretly at watch. It was a deep, soundless minute at the end of which my impulse failed. He was quiet. He might be innocent. The risk was hideous. I turned away. There was a figure in the grounds, a figure prowling for a sight. The visitor, with whom Flora was engaged, but it wasn't the visitor most concerned with my boy. I hesitated afresh. But on other grounds, and only a few seconds, then I had made my choice. There were empty rooms enough at Bly, and it was only a question of choosing the right one. The right one suddenly presented itself to me as the lower one, though high above the gardens. In the solid corner of the house that I have spoken of as the old tower, this was a large square chamber, arranged with some state as a bedroom, the extravagant size of which made it so inconvenient that it had not for years, though kept by Mrs. Gross an exemplary order, been occupied. I had often admired it, and I knew my way around in it. I had only, after just faltering, at the first chill gloom of its disuse, to pass across it and unbolt in all quietness one of the shutters. Achieving this transition, I uncovered the glass without a sound, and applying my face to the pane, was able, in the darkness without being much less than within, uh, to see that I commanded the right direction. Then I saw something more. The moon made the night extraordinarily penetrable and showed me on the lawn a person diminished by distance, 
who stood there motionless and as if fascinated, looking up to where I had appeared, looking, that is, not so much straight at me as at something that was apparently above me. There was clearly another person above me. There was a person on the tower, but the presence on the lawn was not in the least what I had conceived and had confidently hurried to meet. The presence on the lawn, I felt sick as I made it out, was poor little Miles himself. That will conclude today's reading. Thank you for joining us at the Toro County Public Library for our reading of Henry James's Turn of the Screw. We hope to see you next time. Thank you.